listen to all those voices. Tens of thousands of students in more than 120 countries are skipping school today. They're doing it to call attention to the urgency of global warming and demand action from their elected leaders. In the United States, climate change is rarely front and center of political campaigns, but the race for 2020 may be different. Whether the fossil fuel industry likes it or not, we will transform our energy system. We have one chance to defeat climate ch change, and it is right now. We face catastrophe and crisis on this planet, even if we were to stop emitting carbon today, right now, at this moment. It is a fact that we can change human behaviors without much change to our lifestyle, and we can save the future generations of our country and this world. Well, you know my next guest has been one of the leading voices of combating climate change, former Vice President Al Gore. He is hosting Climate Reality Leadership Corps training in Atlanta today. Mr. Vice President, a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for focusing on this, Brooke, and for having me on. You got it. We'll dive right into it in just a second, but I'd be remiss not to, to get your reaction to the terror attacks in New Zealand. This white supremacist is accused uh, in them, his anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim manifesto, just another example in, in the rise of right-wing extremism. Even, sir, today in the U.S., the FBI reports uh, a rise in domestic terror arrests. So your, your reaction today? Well, it's heartbreaking, of course, Brooke, uh, and my heart goes out to the victims and their families. Uh, great respect for uh, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, who's handled this uh, so gracefully and well. Uh, it was jarring here in Atlanta, where w we had last night, just before w this news broke, an interfaith mass meeting with Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Hindu, uh, Native American leaders, 2,300 people at historic Ebenezer Baptist mm. Church with Reverend Warnock and Reverend William Barber II. And the healing uh, process that comes from reaching out to one another across these uh, ancient lines uh, is much more powerful than mm. these uh, acts of evil, and we must move beyond them. Speaking of Atlanta, Mr. Vice President, despite all the science, all the warnings, there are still skeptics at the highest level of government to what do you attribute that? <laughs> well, I don't think that there are, I, I, obviously there's no basis for uh, doubting what the Mother Nature is telling us now. It's beyond the consensus of 99% of the scientists. Just listen to Mother Nature uh, and the climate related extreme weather events uh, have quadrupled in recent years. Uh, here in the U.S. alone, in less than nine years, we've had 17 once in a thousand year events. And they keep on coming and they keep on getting worse. So uh, the old strategy of trying to uh, fool people <laughs> into disbelieving the evidence in front of their own eyes is, is failing. And we're crossing a tipping point now, Brooke. Uh, we're seeing many uh, Republicans uh, change uh, their positions and join the growing bipartisan consensus. And the debate's not about uh, the science. That debate's long since over. The debate now is about the best ways to move as fast as we can to solve this crisis. But, but what about the, the, the leader of all Republicans, the, the, the president himself? I mean, if, if inaction continues for the next two, maybe six years under a, you know, a Trump <clears throat> White House, well, uh, what, it, what, what concerns you? What, what is the one immediate consequence on climate? Well, actually, in, um, in what might, some might call a perverse way, I, I think the fact that Donald J. Trump has become the global face of climate denial is actually encouraging a lot more people <laughs> to join the cause of helping bring about the solutions more rapidly. Uh, he cannot withdraw from the Paris Agreement, by the way, legally. Uh, the first date we could is the day after the next presidential election. So the fate of this issue is not in his hands. It's in our hands. And a, a large and growing bipartisan majority in this country 
uh, is now saying definitively to politicians and uh, office holders, it's time to act, and, and the sooner the better, the bolder the better. Hmm. Uh, I know that you have praised the Green New Deal uh, and how it started a dialogue, but which part, which part, Mr. Vice President, would, you know, in looking at it, do you believe needs to be fixed or, or maybe unrealistic at this point? Well, I think it's an aspirational goal that makes it possible for large majorities to come together in a common demand that the U.S. change its approach. I'll tell you what it reminds me of. Brooke, and years ago, uh, when I was working on the issue of nuclear arms control, there was a, a movement called the Nuclear Freeze Movement, uh, and it was criticized as being uh, naive, and experts uh, said that it had elements that were unrealistic. But 75 percent of the American people said, we're in favor of a nuclear freeze. Uh, and the particulars uh, didn't all get uh, enacted, but it served as a mechanism for the American people to move their political leaders, including Ronald Reagan, who started off in the campaign of 1980 talking about the evil empire and talking about uh, massive build-up, uh, build-ups of nuclear weapons, and ended up advocating a nuclear zero uh, initiative with mm -hmm. Gorbachev in the, in the then Soviet Union. So I think the Green New Deal is a bit like that. Uh, we can argue about the particulars and specifics as it comes into form, but the general notion, solve the climate crisis and create millions of new jobs while we're doing it, that's got a huge majority support and it is now emerging as a mandate from the American people. And it's not just, obviously, members of Congress, you know, whether you're on the left or the right. I mean, we just played a second ago these clips of these young people today. All these, these young people around the world walking out of school, they are so passionate about this, almost in a way that we haven't seen in a really long time. And I'm wondering why you think, what, what is leading to such a politically active generation, especially when it comes to climate? They get it. And actually, this is in the tradition of all the great morally based uh, movements in, in our history uh, where young people have played key roles. Uh, here in your hometown of Atlanta, where the civil rights movement was kind of based, young people were in the vanguard of that civil rights movement. And it always has been so. And where climate is concerned, it's especially true because these young people are going to live longer and live with the consequences mm -hmm. of the climate crisis longer. Uh, and they've studied it in school. They understand it, most of them, very clearly. In, in fact, I'm very proud that one of the graduates of our Climate Reality Project, Young Haven Coleman, went through our training program a few years ago in Denver at the age of 11. And she is one of the co-leaders of this student school strike movement in the U.S. We just had a panel of four very young people here, and boy, are they articulate <laughs> and bright and persuasive, and they're they passionate about this. And, and one of them said, I'm 16 years old, and I'm on school strike today, but I'm warning <laughs> you all, in 2020, I'm voting. We're coming for those of you who are not helping to solve this crisis. So... Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for my segue. We've got to talk 2020. I can't let you go. You know, many of the Democrats, many of the newcomers are moving the party to the left. You know, you were elected as a moderate. Which type of candidate do you think can actually beat President Trump? Well, I think that the American people are going to provide the answer to that in the oh, primaries and Oh, come on, Mr. Caucuses, Vice President. But I, Pro progressive, no, I moderate. I think that's true. I think it's... Well, I think those labels, uh, this will sound like a cliche to you, but I believe it's true, Brooke, that those labels are way out of date. Uh, if you're in favor of solving the climate crisis, for example, does that automatically make you progressive or is that a conservative position to conserve what we have? Uh, and what I'm most encouraged about is that so many of the Democratic candidates, and by the way, John Kasich on the uh, Republican side, if he ends up announcing, uh, are all emphasizing climate as one of their very top issues, either number one or in the top two or three. That's a big change, and I think it's a very 
healthy change and it, it bodes well for what happens uh, when I hope we have a, a new president. Um, I've got to ask, have any of these candidates reached out to you? Have, have you advised any of them? I, I have talked with several of them at the, their request. I'll keep all those conversations confidential, but I, yes, I, I know several of them and have talked with them and some that I had not known before. Flat out, Mr. Vice President, should Joe Biden run? Leaving that up to him. He's a good friend and a great guy, a great record of public service. I, I'm not going to meddle in his decision. Okay, former Vice President Al Gore, good luck to you. Enjoy Atlanta, and thank you for what you're doing. I appreciate it. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Brooke.